A number of years ago, I read a series of books dealing with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis' takeover of Europe, first Germany, then Austria, then Czechoslovakia, and then on and on it went. Everywhere the Nazi machine went in Europe, there was shameful and inhumane treatment of people, unbelievable cruelty and complete callousness to the feelings of their fellow human beings. And the thoughts of many back then and even today have been, how could men be so cruel? But the heartless behavior of Nazi Germany should not really be a complete surprise to anyone because the Bible teaches that man's behavior, man's nature is inherently evil and that he's capable of the most degrading of atrocities. And the clearest demonstration, folks, of man's wickedness and his sadistic capabilities is not the Nazi soldiers of the 1930s and 1940s, as bad as they were, but rather the Roman soldiers of the first century, the men who mocked and brutally assaulted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we read this about their mockery in Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off, off of him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. Now, these verses tell us what happened to Jesus immediately after his Roman trial was over. There, there had been a Jewish trial led by the Sanhedrin, and then the Roman trial. This tells us what happened after the Roman trial had ended. The trial ended when Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, his final attempt to release Jesus had failed. We learn from the Gospel of John that after Pilate had, scour had scourged Jesus, he brought him out to show the people what a pathetic, broken man Jesus really was, hoping that this would provoke their, their sympathy, their compassion, and they would feel that Jesus had just suffered enough, and as a result, asked the governor not to crucify him. But they didn't do that. Instead, when the chief priests and the scribes saw Jesus, John tells us in his gospel account that they continued to cry out, crucify, crucify. And then the members of the Sanhedrin said those fateful words that finally pushed the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, over the edge in deciding to crucify Christ, even though Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent of all wrongdoing. Here's what the Jewish leaders said to Pilate. John chapter 19, verse 12. If you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, upon hearing those words, Pilate knew. He knew that he had lost the battle. He hated the Jewish people. They hated him. They had had a number of battles and conflicts, and uh, he knew this was very serious because he understood that their statement was a subtle threat that he better not oppose and oppose them and release Jesus because if he did, then they would be sure to let his superiors in Rome know that he opposed Caesar. And the proof of his opposition to the emperor was that when given the opportunity, he did not crucify a rival king and a man who was a potential threat to Caesar's supremacy. That is the threat. And so we read in John 19, verse 16, the very sad words, because Pilate understood exactly what they were saying. We're going to go to your authorities. We're going to go to your superiors. You better do as we want. And so we read, he, meaning Pilate, Pilate, 
handed him, meaning Jesus, over to them, meaning the Roman soldiers, to be crucified. Now the verses before us from Matthew chapter 27, they tell us what happened to Jesus right after his trial, but before his crucifixion. They tell us about how the Roman soldiers shamefully and cruelly mocked Jesus as king. This is actually a very difficult passage to read and to study. Emotionally, it's difficult because anyone who loves the Lord can't help but but feel extreme anguish when we read what the Roman soldiers did to our Lord, how they beat him, how they stripped him naked and put a heavy purple robe on him, taunted him, mocked him, spit in his face. But as difficult as it is to read and study, about our precious, innocent Lord being treated this way, we do need to study these verses. It's imperative that we study these verses because these are God's words to us. And according to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is not only God-breathed, but because it's God-breathed, it is profitable. So what we need then to understand and, and learn in studying this passage is how these verses are profitable to us. They're profitable how? In other words, how can a passage of scripture that shows such scorn being heaped upon our Lord, how can it benefit us? How can it profit us? That is to say, why did Matthew, who in his gospel narrative presents Christ as Israel's glorious King and Messiah, why would he want us to see Jesus now so dishonored, so treated horribly by such a band of ruthless Roman soldiers. Why? The answer is this, because Jesus Christ is the king who came to be scorned, came to be humiliated, came to be treated this way. Jesus is the king who came to be mocked and to die as the substitute uh, sin bearer for us. This is why we love him so much, because he first loved us. When we hated him, he loved us. And he gave his life for us. You see, even in the midst of seeing Jesus mocked like this, we do still catch a glimpse of his glory as the all-knowing sovereign God. Because what happened to him was exactly what Jesus predicted would happen to him because he was sovereignly orchestrating all the events that would happen to him. All the, the mockery and the mistreatment by these Gentile Roman soldiers. In fact, Jesus had very specifically predicted what would happen. Going back to Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 and 19, here's what we read. As Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he'll be raised up. The Lord predicted this. This was precisely how the Old Testament said that the Messiah would be treated. We read in Isaiah 50 verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. And then there's that classic wonderful passage of Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 through 7 where Isaiah says, predicted hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened how the Jewish people would treat their own Messiah. He was despised and forsaken of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Now, watch this. 
Just as Matthew, throughout his gospel accounts, has presented Christ as Israel's true king, and he's done it in a variety of ways, by the witness of John the Baptist, by the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies, by Christ's royal and majestic behavior, by Christ's authoritative teaching, by Christ's ability to make prophetic statements come true, by his divine mastery over demons and illnesses. So now, here, in Matthew 27, he presents Christ to us as the king who is humiliated and mocked, even though in the words of Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, at the moment of this sadistic beating, no one on earth looked less like a king than Jesus. But folks, Jesus Christ is the true king, regardless of how he looked, regardless of how he was treated, and he went through all of this inhumane treatment for sinners like us, simply because of his grace and love and for no other reason, certainly not because we're lovely people. Now, if we were engaged in a study of the gospel of Matthew, instead of the Gospel of Luke, we would see that leading up to the cross, Matthew presents a number of human reasons, just setting aside for the moment sovereign reasons, but human reasons why Jesus was crucified. Based on the responses of the various people involved in his death, specifically I'm referring to the Sanhedrin, Pontius Pilate, and the Jewish people as a whole. And in the verses before us, Matthew tells us the response of now the Roman soldiers to Jesus. And in doing so, he helps us to understand why the Roman soldiers so mistreated Christ. I mean, we, we know, as I said, if we had studied the Gospel of Matthew together, we would know that the Sanhedrin wanted Jesus dead because he was the legitimate king of the Jews. He was the legitimate head of Israel. And therefore, he was a threat to their power over the Jewish people. So they wanted him eliminated. Matthew makes that very clear. Also, the crowd of Jewish people, the mainstream of the people, they wanted Christ dead because they were disappointed, they were angry, they were frustrated with him because he dashed their hopes that he was the Messiah warrior king who was going to deliver them from Rome's oppression. And so they're very frustrated because he obviously didn't come to do that. And Pontius Pilate, as we saw, he ordered Jesus to die because he was fearful of what the Roman emperor might do to him if he had another clash with the Jewish people. So he cowardly acquiesced to the people's desire to have Jesus crucified. All of that, Matthew, is made clear. But the question facing us today is this. Why did the Roman soldiers make sport of Jesus before they crucified him? I mean, what reason did they have for such scornful mistreatment of Christ. Well, that's what we're going to discover this morning as we prepare our hearts to come to the table and observe the Lord's Supper. So as we come to these verses before us in Matthew chapter 27, we're going to first see the precise mocking that the Roman soldiers heaped upon Jesus. And then, though the text doesn't explicitly state why they mocked him, we can make some common sense deductions as to why they did it, leading us then to make the conclusion that there were three reasons why they mocked Christ. So let's begin first by looking at the mocking of Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort, cohort around him. Now, Matthew begins by telling us that after Pontius Pilate pronounced the death sentence upon Jesus and handed him over to the soldiers to be crucified, that the Lord was then taken by these soldiers to a place called here the Praetorium, which is simply a name for the governor's headquarters while he was in the city of Jerusalem, the Praetorium. And upon entering the building, we read that the soldiers who took Jesus from Pilate, called the Roman cohort, gathered around him. So what is a Roman cohort? We don't use those terms in military circles today. What is a Roman cohort? Well, technically, a Roman cohort consisted of six 
600 Roman soldiers. But it's unlikely that 600 soldiers gathered around Jesus. Sometimes, though, we see from literature that the term cohort was used to speak of a considerably smaller number of soldiers, usually consisting of approximately 200 men. And so it is more likely that this is closer to the number of soldiers who gathered around Jesus. About 200, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Now, who were these soldiers? Well, obviously they were Romans in that they were in the service of the Roman government, but this doesn't mean that they were ethnically Roman in the sense that they were from Italy or even Italian by background. You see, the Roman government had a policy. Uh, the policy was to recruit soldiers from the countries that they occupied, that they took over. And then they would send these soldiers to the neighboring regions that had a similar language and culture. So in all probability, the Roman soldiers who had gathered around Jesus were most likely from the province of Syria, just a little bit to the north of Israel, and therefore they were able to speak Aramaic, which was the language spoken by the Jewish people at that time. Now, what makes this significant is that these soldiers were very likely, as I said, originally from Syria, and therefore they probably had very little knowledge of Jesus and his ministry in Israel. Therefore, to these soldiers, Jesus was nobody special, just another prisoner condemned to die. But they were certainly aware of the charges against him that he had claimed to be the king of the Jews and was therefore accused of being a rival to their emperor, Caesar. So they decide to amuse themselves by making sport of Jesus. The 200 or so soldiers now gather around him and they proceed to cruelly mock him as king. And the next few verses tell us exactly what they, they did to him. Verse 28, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. According to Matthew, the first thing they did in mocking Jesus was they removed his clothing and put a scarlet robe on him in order to dress him up to look like a king in royal garments. Mark, in his gospel account, says that this robe was the color of purple, purple being the color of royalty, which would seem to indicate that this was probably a discarded and faded soldier's military cloak. Now, just a, f a few minutes prior to this, Jesus had been whipped by being scourged. And so in the words of one writer, his back was a mass of bleeding wounds and quivering muscles. So to have a robe then placed on his naked mutilated body, folks, it would have been excruciatingly painful as you could well imagine. But they didn't care about Jesus. He was gonna die soon anyway by way of crucifixion, so what did they care? See, this was all a little game to these soldiers. This man claimed to be a king, so we're gonna have some fun by dressing him up to look like a king. And since a king has to have a crown and a royal scepter, a rod, they proceeded to give these items to Jesus as we read in the next couple of verses, verses 29 and 30. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After placing the scarlet, purplish colored robe on him, we read that the soldiers made a crown, or really it's a, a royal, a laurel wreath out of some nearby thorns, which are very prevalent in Israel. And they pressed them down on Christ's head, which must have cut deeply into his scalp. Then they placed a reed in his hand, which was intended to look like a king's scepter or a rod, which was a symbol of a king's power and authority. And with this crown of thorns on his head and this silly looking reed in his hand, the soldiers then fell to their knees one by one in front of Jesus, mocking and ridiculing him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. But they weren't finished. After getting up from their knees, each soldier took the stick from Christ's hand and they proceeded to beat him on the head with it. Then they spit in his face, which was considered as insulting then as it is today. 
It was just their way of saying to Jesus, this is what we think of, of your kingship. You're just a joke to us. And when this cruel, inhumane, sadistic mock coronation was over, and the soldiers had finished taunting and making sport of Jesus, then we read what happened next in verse 31. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. Now this is how the Roman soldiers mocked the king of kings. But again, the question is why? Why did they treat him like this? What were their motives for being so inhumane and insensitive to the, to the Son of God? Well, as I said earlier, Matthew does not explicitly state any specific reasons for the soldiers' cruel behavior towards Christ. But we can deduce from their actions several, specifically three reasons, why they treated him this way based on what we know about these men and the situation that they found themselves in. And folks, this is relevant. This is relevant for us. The relevancy is that each of these reasons for why these soldiers did what they did to Christ has a modern parallel giving us insight as to why people today continue to reject and scorn and scoff at Christ and the gospel. So we move now from the mocking of Jesus by the soldiers to the reasons for the soldiers mocking of Jesus with the first reason being this, they mocked Jesus out of blind ignorance. Blind ignorance. It's important to realize that unlike the Jewish leaders and the crowd of Jewish people in Jerusalem, the Roman soldiers were not, as I said, familiar with Jesus. They didn't, they didn't know much of anything about him. So what they did to him was really unrelated to any religious or personal animosity. And unlike Pontius Pilate, they had nothing to gain or to lose politically by the way they treated Christ. So we can conclude then that what they did to the Lord, they just did out of ignorance, blind ignorance, because they didn't know what they were doing or who they were doing it to. They had no clue. Folks, it is important to understand that blind ignorance is the same reason, the very same reason that people today reject Jesus Christ. Multitudes see Jesus as a joke, someone to scorn, someone to mock, and casually to use his, his name along with vulgarity. And they don't really know why they, they do this. They don't know why they feel this way about him. They just do. But the reason they do this is because they are spiritually blind. And, <coughs> excuse me. And being blind, they're ignorant of who he really is. This is the way it is with all fallen humanity, not just these men. We read these penetrating words by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Starting in verse 3, Paul said, And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world, and that's Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So Paul says that although the gospel message is very clearly about Jesus Christ and who he is, and God has revealed that to us, who he is, he is the image of the invisible God, yet unbelieving people, they just can't see the truth about him. They can't see it, and the reason they can't see it is because in choosing to rebel against the truth about God, which all humanity does, Satan then blinds them to the truth so that they can no longer see the truth, even if they wanted to, which they don't want to. This is why these Roman soldiers, though they had the King of Kings and the Lord of all lords standing right in front of them, they couldn't see who he was. They were blind. And the irony of what they did is that they mocked him as a king and dressed him up to look like a king, and yet they had no idea that he really was the greatest of all kings. The king of the universe was standing in front of them, God in human flesh, and they couldn't see it. As one Bible teacher put it, Jesus didn't look 
like a king then, but no ruler seated upon any earthly throne at the pinnacle of worldly power was ever more entitled to be called a king than was Jesus. But the soldiers didn't see him that way at all. They didn't see him as a king because they were spiritually blind and ignorant. And they're, as I said, they, they weren't unique. This is the plight of all humanity. We read these words from Paul to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. There is a darkness, a darkness of mind, a darkness of spirit that's true of every unbeliever. And that's why these soldiers were able to so mistreat Christ and have so much contempt for him without any concern because they didn't know who he was. You see, the reason why so many people today mock Christ and mock his gospel is because they're blind to the truth. Just like those Roman soldiers, they don't realize who Jesus really is. This is why you can witness and witness and witness to some people and they just don't get it. Even if they are highly intelligent, highly educated, they don't get it. And therefore, what is so precious to you as a believer in Christ means absolutely nothing to them. Not at all. And the reason for this is because they are spiritually blind and they cannot see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And what's more, they want to stay blind. They want to stay there. They're not interested in gaining their sight. And Jesus tells us the reason why. In John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, he said, this is the judgment that the light, meaning himself, has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed Listen, people aren't interested in coming to the light, coming to Christ, because that would require them to have their evil deeds exposed, and they're not willing to do that because they have no desire to turn from their evil deeds by repentance. So what can we do? What, what, what can we do? If people are blind and they can't see who Christ is, and some of us have loved ones like that, well, what can we do? They don't want to see who he is. What in the world can we do to help them? What hope is there for them if that's their condition? We can't force them to see the truth. We're not capable of giving them spiritual sight. But what we can do is pray for them, pray for their salvation, and use the word of God to bring the gospel to them. We witness to them. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We emphasize here at Lakeside a lot the sovereignty of God. And it is God's work of sovereign grace in a person's heart that brings them to faith. That's absolutely true. But the Lord doesn't work outside of using us to proclaim the gospel. We are are the means by which that happens. We proclaim the gospel and he uses the gospel to sovereignly bring the people to faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the the word about Christ. And if we do that, if we pray for souls to be saved, and we faithfully present the gospel as God opens doors to us, some will respond. Certainly not all, but some will respond because God in his mercy will open their eyes and he will bring them to faith in Christ. There are two verses from the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, that tell us how people come to Christ when they are blind and unable to see the truth. First is John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. And then a few verses later, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Now, what these two verses, precious verses, reveal is that all who have been given to Jesus Christ by the Father in eternity past, which means that they have been sovereignly chosen to be saved, they are the the elect, they will eventually come to Christ for salvation. And when they do come to him, Jesus will receive them and never, ever, ever turn them away. This is, these statements, 
ought to give every believer a wonderful, great sense of assurance of your salvation, regardless of how you, you feel about your salvation, regardless of how you struggle with it. Listen, if you have come to Christ, you have repented of your sin, the best you know how you have forsaken your sin and you have placed your trust in Christ alone for your salvation, you can be certain because God has promised you that, that Christ will never turn you away. He has received you just as you have received him. You have his word on it regardless of how you feel. And the reason that the elect come to Jesus is because as verse 44 says, God the Father draws them. Now that's still a mystery to us. It has to do with regeneration and, and God working in their hearts. But, but he draws them, meaning that he brings them to Christ. He does this by supernaturally opening their eyes to the truth as he gives them eternal life. He gives them, this is regeneration. They're, they're made alive after they've been dead spiritually and they see so that now they see who Jesus really is. And as a result, they come to him, placing their faith in him as Savior and Lord. But note this, as I said earlier, this drawing of the elect by the Father, it does not take place apart from him using people like you, people like me, to witness to them and to pray for them. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So what you can do for those who are blind and ignorant about Christ, you pray for them. Specifically, you ask the Lord to open their eyes to save them. And then you ask him to give you opportunities to faithfully witness to them clearly sharing the gospel. So that's the first reason. The first reason that soldiers mocked Jesus was because of their blind ignorance. But listen, knowing something about the Roman soldiers, what they were like, leads us to a second reason that they mocked Jesus, and that's because they were conditioned to mistreat Christ. See, Roman soldiers were battle-hardened men, as you could well imagine, men who were used to bloodshed. They were used to the sight of human suffering and and torture. As soldiers, they had witnessed the shedding of blood many, many, many times. And in addition to all the battles that they had fought, they found delight in watching gladiators butchering each other just for the sport of it. I mean, this was their culture's form of entertainment. So it really isn't surprising that this band of soldiers would gloat over the sufferings of Christ and turn his pain into brutal shame and mockery. See, these men were conditioned, conditioned to be callous to the pain and the feelings of another human being. They were culturally conditioned to act this way without a, a twinge of guilt. No guilt bothering their conscience. They enjoyed what they did as schoolboys enjoy terrorizing and torturing a helpless animal. But the cruel behavior of the soldiers towards Jesus, it does give us some important insight as to why so many today continue to reject Christ. You see, part of the reason for individuals today rejecting the Lord is that they've been conditioned, conditioned by their culture to think that Jesus and Christianity and Christians are not to be taken seriously and that anyone who believes in him and the gospel is just narrow-minded and intolerant and not particularly very bright. As we saw in our study Last week on the Beatitude that highlights persecution for the sake of righteousness, the world we live in is hostile to Christ and to biblical standards. And constant exposure to that kind of hostility and negativity, especially by the news media, culturally conditions people and makes them captive to the way that the world thinks. If you hear it over and over and over again, these lies, you're going to believe them. It is really quite rare, very unusual to encounter a non-Christian who thinks for himself, who will challenge the current thinking of the world about Christ by thinking critically over the issues of sin, judgment, and his or her need for the Savior. 
See, people have been so conditioned to oppose the gospel that most of their objections to Christianity, if you hear enough objections as you witness to Christianity, you'll realize that there's nothing new under the sun. They're the same old issues that have been circulating for many, many years. And the reason is because they've been conditionally, they've been culturally conditioned to think like this. Well, what about, yeah, you say this, but what about culturally conditioned? Like these Roman soldiers, most people today scorn Christ, and they don't even know why they do this. They, they've, they've never had an intelligent thought as to why they do this. Instead of honestly facing the issues of the gospel and doing some independent thinking, they just follow the crowd by embracing the thinking of others, perhaps family, friends, coaches, teachers, somebody who, who has an impact, who, who's influential in their lives, and they just go along with their thinking. See, it never occurred to one of these Roman soldiers to consider that Jesus, you know, just might be the king of the Jews. We might really have the king of the Jews in front of us. And the reason it never occurred to them is because they let Pilate, they let the Jewish crowd, they let the Sanhedrin do their thinking for them. And that's why they mocked and rejected Christ. So what have we seen so far? We've seen two reasons why the Roman soldiers mocked Jesus. They mocked him out of blind ignorance and they mocked him because they were conditioned to mistreat and mock him. But there's a third reason that the soldiers mocked Jesus and that's because, number three, they let their prejudice against Jewish people influence their attitude against Jesus. According to the New Testament, the official charge against Jesus was that, was that he was the king of the Jews. That's what was on the wooden square thing above Christ's cross, king of the Jews, which means from the perspective of the Roman soldiers that they, that, that according to their perspective, Jesus was guilty of treason against their government. That's how they saw it. And that wasn't something they took lightly because as Romans, they felt this deep sense of loyalty to their king Caesar, and therefore they despised all Jewish hopes for a king of their own. So they took this occasion to vent their malice on, on this audacious rabbi who dared to say he was the Jewish nation's king. You see, these Roman soldiers, they didn't have, as I said, they didn't have any personal animosity towards Jesus. They didn't feel like he had personally wronged them. It's just that Jesus represented all Jewish people to these Roman soldiers. And since they, like their commander Pontius Pilate, they hated, who hated the Jewish people, they hated them too. They're just following their leader. And they took this opportunity to express their deep-seated anti-Jewish feelings against Jesus. Now folks, here's the application. In a similar way, people today often reject Christ, not because they know of any valid reason to despise him, because there is no valid reason to despise the Holy One, but because they have something against a Christian. A Christian who, in representing Christ to them, did something terribly wrong to them, and as a result gave the Lord a bad name in their eyes. It may be a Christian who's acted like a two-faced hypocrite, by not living according to biblical standards, saying one thing but not living that way. It may be a Christian who is rude or insensitive or who deeply hurts someone by something they said, something they did. It may be a Christian who lied to them. It may be a Christian who cheated them out of some money. Regardless of what the specific sin is, the way a Christian behaves has a great deal to do with the way that non-Christians view Jesus and the gospel. Listen to what Paul wrote concerning how the Jewish people in ancient times gave their God a bad name amongst the Gentiles by the way they behaved. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. He's talking now the Gentiles are the people, the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiments of knowledge and of the truth. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? 
You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Listen, just as the Jewish people during Old Testament times blasphemed God's name amongst the Gentiles because of their hypocritical, sinful behavior. So the Jewish people during the time of Jesus and the time of the Apostle Paul no doubt did the same thing with the same results. And as a result, Gentiles of that day dishonored God and hated the Jewish people. And included in, included in that group of Gentiles were Roman soldiers who vented their hostility and their prejudice against the people of Israel by mocking Jesus who claimed to be their king. Now folks, as believers in Christ, tragically, we often do the very same thing. We misrepresent our Lord by the hypocritical and inconsistent way we, we live. And unbelievers then, they want nothing to do with our God because of us. And that says volumes to us as we transition now to the Lord's Supper because...